Welcome to Nevada News Makers on the broadcast today. Former Chief of Staff to Governor Gwynn, Mike Hillaby joins us. Plus on the Power of Punnett panel, Joe Guild, Susan Fisher, and Pat Hickey. It's all coming up next on an all new Nevada Newsmakers. 40 years ago, Hotel California and the theme from Rocky were number one on the pop charts and D&D &D Roofing and Sheet Metal started on the road to becoming Nevada's leading roofing company. I couldn't be more proud of what we've achieved. And over these 40 years, we've become an employee-owned company. So when you're talking to any employee, you're talking to an owner. And here's to the next 40 years. Happy 40th birthday, D&D &D Roofing and Sheet Metal. Nearly 200,000 Nevadans work in retail businesses, supporting families and the community. Nevada's retail businesses generated over $2 billion in sales tax revenue in one year, including nearly $700 million to help our schools. Shop around and see all that Nevada's retailers offer our state. We're the Retail Association of Nevada, representing thousands of Nevada businesses. Businesses that work for Nevada. Pro Group Management specializes in providing industries with the necessary components to satisfy and exceed workers' comp requirements. Every business has unique needs and specific regulations. Pro Group Management stays ahead of the curve, providing up-to-date services to keep your industry in top form. Discover how we simplify your tasks, improve efficiency, and reduce expense to keep you moving in a positive direction. Pro Group Management. Workers' comp that works for you. Truck drivers are some of the hardest working people you'll meet, delivering over 70% of America's freight and 92% of Nevada's. When there's a natural disaster, they're delivering critical supplies to help those communities recover and rebuild. Every sector of the economy and our nation's military rely on truck drivers. So let's take a moment to say thank you. On the open road or city streets, our truck drivers are rolling to make our economy and our nation stronger. Trucking moves America forward. This is Nevada Newsmakers with host Sam Shad, a no-holds-barred political forum. Now, from the Nevada Newsmakers broadcast headquarters, here is Sam Shad. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, coming to you from the state capitol with the old Supreme Court here in Carson City with Mike Killaby, former Chief of Staff to Governor Gwynn, and now with Ken Crow. Pleasure to have you back on the program, sir. Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, what do you think of the pace of this session so far? Well, I think everybody's talked about sort of the slow pace of getting bills introduced. I'm sure you've talked about previously on the, the show, the deadline for bill introduction had to be waived because they were just behind with drafting. You've, got, you've seen a lot of turnover um, in the behind the scenes at the legislature, term limits, you've got legislators giving more skeleton ideas for bills. So that really slowed things down. I think it was a really smart move last week that leadership did not waive the deadline for bills to be out of committee. Uh, that deadline has always been a little bit squishy because people will make the case to go park their, their bills in one of the money committees to get at least a temporary reprieve. That's often right. the place many go to die to ex <laughs> extend, extend the death date past, past the uh, committee passage. But it's starting to pick up. As we all joke, this is sort of the beginning of Act 2 now. And then uh, things will pick up quite a bit again once the Economic Forum meets in a couple of weeks and tells everybody how much money we have. Uh, Assemblywoman Hansen was on the program a week or so ago and was talking about how fast things were moving. And they're like, it's going to get a lot faster. It, it will. <laughs> and I think that's the, uh, that's the part that's a little bit ironic is how quickly things do move, how hard it is to get time to sit as all those bills drop at, at one time very late in the process and needing to be heard before that deadline how hard it is to actually get much work done because it's you are just moving so quickly so many hearings hearings getting longer and longer and have opportunity for legislators for us to sit down and talk with them get some history on issues understand a little bit more what some of the ramifications are so yeah it's moved very quickly in that respect and also i mean you know from the chaos at the beginning of the session uh with the leader um being forced to step down um, you know, that created a whole set of problems. It did, uh, and unlike anything I've, I've ever seen, certainly, to have a, a majority leader, any, any legislator, resign midterm and likely be headed to prison for campaign finance, uh, then Assemblyman Sprinkle had to resign um, his seat. So it definitely changed the dynamic a little bit and slowed some things down. I think the legislature and I think the current leadership really deserves some credit. They moved, I think, as quickly and as seamlessly as you could, given those kinds of circumstances and getting People uh, moved around onto committees, keeping the work going. Um, you know, Leslie Cohen took over as the chair of Health and Human Services, and she's been a quick study trying to figure all those issues out and keep that 
committee moving forward. So I think they've done a good job trying to recover from that. Um, let's hit some specific issues here. Healthcare has obviously been a big issue at this session. It is, and I think you're seeing statewide, uh, particularly in states where de uh, Democrats are in control, like in Nevada, a real move to try to protect as many pieces of the Affordable Care Act from likely attacks at the federal level. Some of those you can do state by state, others are a lot harder. A lot of the pieces of the ACA really dependent on a larger market, larger market forces, but things like uh, pr protection from pre-existing conditions, which matter a lot to a lot of people. Uh, Senator Julie Ratty and others were very instrumental in getting that bill, and to their credit, um, listened to the industry, listened to the people involved about the specifics, um, spent the time to get the language right and moving a bill forward, so that one's moving forward nicely. Um, other pieces, uh, again, to try to either protect things from uh, in, within the ACA. The more problematic are sort of uh, trying to go after specific disease states, specific mandated benefits. It's a challenge in Nevada and, and in other states how small a percentage of the market the legislature and the state actually regulate. When you take the federally regulated plans, the large self-funded employer plans, the union plans out, you carve out Medicare, uh, VA benefits, all the other things, you're left with in the private insurance market about 7% of the population. So that's really all they impact, and that 7% in Nevada is a relatively small number, which makes that even more volatile. So it's tough. Those are all things that there are great cases to be made and emotional cases to be made where it would be wonderful if, as an insurer, we could cover everything, then it wouldn't be insurance anymore. You'd be paying full price for everything. Um, so it's a tough one. Uh, yeah, to say the least. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting um, to see the battle on the federal level because Obamacare has been around long enough now that people have accepted it as the status quo, as they have with Social Security, Medicare, et cetera. And once something has become entrenched like that, even on a federal level, it's going to be extremely difficult to get rid of that. It is. The proponents for any kind of government benefit always have that advantage. As soon as you put it on the books, people feel like they've had it forever and, and have a, a real sense of ownership with that, particularly when you're talking about, as you mentioned, Social Security health benefits, retirement benefits, those kind of benefits that you sort of see and feel every day. It doesn't take long before people really take that for granted that that's something that they ought to have and keep. Um, the other big uh, discussion topic um, with all the candidates for president on the Democratic side is the Medicare for all situation. I don't think that people really understand you know, what that is and what that would cost. Because the fact is that most people who, you know, have qualified for Medicare have been paying in their entire working life. So to give Medicare for everybody from day one would be an incredible financial burden. I mean, I think Massachusetts looked at it and, and stopped it because they just said it would bankrupt us. Right. So the, the challenges with Medicare for all are primarily from the, the perspective of providers, hospitals, physicians, others. At what rate are you reimbursing people? Right now the market is really a mess in the hospital world. Uh, almost 80% of patients come into the hospital pay less than the cost of the care. Not less than the bill, less than the actual cost of their care because they're on some kind of government program, be it Medicaid, Medicare, or something else. Um, the Medicare rate setting process is very different. Uh, it does not always cover the cost of care, even to go to your physician's office. That's why you've seen more and more physicians say, I'm, I've got to get out of this business. I can't make enough money. So the challenge is when you have a payer that wants to pay less than what the market is or what the actual costs are, to put everybody in that creates a real challenge. It would, in my opinion, not just be the cost of the existing program. What would you have to do with rates if suddenly everyone was paying, in many cases, less than what it actually costs to take care of the care? And I think that the realistic way, if you want to do this, is to, say, go 55 plus as against 65 plus and do it that way and then gradually over decades work your way down. But, but to do it all in one shot, I just think is impossible. And, and still the same challenge exists with both Medicare and Medicaid. You've just got a system that doesn't pay what the costs really are out in the marketplace. The emergency room situation, there's been a battle between uh, the hospitals um, that are the regular hospitals and this mm -hmm. new hospital that's opened up on the Strip. Um, where does that sit? So th that's, that bill is moving forward that would require any freestanding emergency room to play by the same rules that every other hospital does. And full disclosure, as you know, we represent um, the largest healthcare system in northern Nevada, and that includes the, the region's only trauma center, the Renown Health. Uh, but that would require any uh, freestanding facility to these freestanding ERs, mini micro hospitals, shadow hospitals, whatever you want to call them, to follow the same rules as everyone else. And that would be to accept Medicare and Medicaid to bill, to do all the reporting, meet the same kinds of safety requirements. There was an argument, oh, it ought to just be free market and let everybody in. 
that would be great, except it isn't a free market. It's a very, very highly regulated market, and the position from the hospitals has been, if you want to enter that market, then you need to play by the same rules as everyone else, and that means you take all comers. You take those patients that don't pay. You pay, take the patients that have particularly government payers that pay far less than cost. You take the private insured, and you figure out how to keep the doors open with that, and you make sure that when someone comes into an emergency room, it's a real emergency room, and you're there to take care of all the things that go along with that. And you're not just taking people in to, quote, the emergency room and then transporting them because you don't have the facilities exactly. to be able to handle the incident. Yeah. Okay, let's take a break. More with Mike Kellaby when we come back. Tamarack Junction is South Reno's hotspot with over 450 of the latest slots and video games. Sully Sports Bar, the Dining Car Restaurant, William Hill Sportsbook, and the Tamarack Steakhouse and Lounge. We're just north of the Summit Mall in South Virginia. Yeah. Because of UMC, I'm putting my free time to good use. Because of UMC, she keeps me on my toes. Because of UMC and this guy, I'm here. UMC, the highest level of care in Nevada. Hi, I'm Eric Robnett, owner of Home Energy Experts. Has this ever happened to you? Honey, did you remember to turn down the thermostat? <sighs> Forgetting to set the temperature? Not fun. We can help. Our new smart thermostat keeps the temperature set for your comfort all by itself. I'm feeling hot now. <sighs> to increase your comfort, go to homeenergyexperts.com for details. That's homeenergyexperts.com. The signs and symptoms of cataracts can start out small with subtle changes in your vision. So don't wait. Be proactive and take your vision into your own hands. If you're experiencing the onset of cataracts or just have questions, contact your eye care professional or call Eye Care Associates of Nevada today. Dr. Hiss has years of experience specializing in the surgical correction of eye disorders and has completed over 84,000 vision correcting procedures. At Eye Care Associates of Nevada, we'll change the way you look at the world. The Tamarack Junction Steakhouse is known for signature steaks, handcrafted cocktails, and world-class wines. Join us Thursdays and Friday nights from 4.30 to 6.30 in the Steakhouse Lounge for live music, gourmet plates, and well-priced wines just north of the Summit Mall on South Virginia. This is Nevada Newsmakers. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, we continue our conversation with Mike Hillaby. Uh, he is with Kemper Kroll and former Chief of Staff to Governor Gwynn. Um, there's, there's an interesting bill going on that involves one of your clients, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. Uh, tell us about this. So the it's bill, a safety issue. It, it, is, it is billed as a safety issue. The, the bill would require that all trains have two-man crews. The railroad industry has, has fought that and said that really ought to be a matter of collective bargaining. These are heavily unionized industries, they're federally regulated, and it would depend on the type of line. Uh, what we don't want is to see a patchwork of laws where you roll from the border of Utah to Nevada and you add crew, take off crew, change the kind of crew, roll to the border of California, and change something else again. Uh, and part of that is it's, it's a bill supported by labor. It's, it's moving r rather rapidly through the legislature, as you can imagine. Our argument, again, is that ought to be done through the labor process. We have two-man crews. That's been a pretty essential part of those labor negotiations and those contracts for a long time. But there are places, and with changes in automation, uh, so short lines that do one thing that may move from a, a mine site to somewhere else, for example, uh, short line that aren't on where passenger lines and other things, that it might make sense to have a single person crew. If you look uh, and go to most cities and get on a subway, you're likely to see one driver on the subway car, um, on and on and on. So again, we don't think that's the, the, the place to do that is at the legislative level. If technology changes, the world changes, you want to change the rules even within the union negotiating process that both sides agree to, you've got a state law behind that that slows those things down. Um, a, a sidebar here is um, uh, on 60 Minutes a few weeks ago, they did a story on uh, rail lines back east where um, the, the, you, you have the, the two-man crew and the conductor is responsible for making sure that the, the rails are switched mm -hmm. um, and that everything is safe. And there's been a couple of major accidents 
um, that have been caused because th those rails were not switched properly. Um, has that come up at all as part of the discussion? It really hasn't. We don't have the, as busy a corridor in terms of passenger service and the mixed uses on the rails as we do in other parts of the country, particularly back east. More uh, obviously Amtrak comes through and you've got some major freight carriers uh, that come through. And as you've got you know, the new kinds of train control systems coming in that uh, are beginning to spread more widely, I don't remember, Sam, I'm sorry, the date at which those have to come in place under federal law, but to be sure that would automatically slow yeah, they, the they train would, down. Yeah, uh, they, they were supposed to come in and they've been delayed several yeah, times it's now. An ex it's an expensive, it's hard to get those rolled out, but those are in process. So again, these are the kinds of things as federal law changes, as uh, the technology changes that we would just assume not have that, the specific kinds of management and labor issues memorialized in state law that can be worked out. Uh, any discussion with the client about uh, Virgin Trains? Yeah, no, haven't talked about that at all. Okay, because I mean, that's going to be an interesting one if they are able to pull that off, and, and maybe they will this time. I think, yeah, actually, some on your list, the other, one of the other issues that's interesting that, again, sort of federal or state, where do you do that? Whole issues around internet privacy, around quote unquote net neutrality. States really anxious to do something, sort of in, in response or in resistance to what the feds are doing or not doing. Again, that's another issue we think that's hard to do state by state. It's tough to regulate the internet. Um, it is, and, and it's a fascinating battle because you've seen the chairman of the FCC um, turn himself into knots here over the last uh, couple of years and uh, you know, from his position of, yes, let's get rid of net neutrality and, you know, uh, approving everything that was coming down the pike. And all of a sudden, especially with the Sinclair situation, um, he started backing away from a lot of those things. So yeah. I don't know if that's protecting his own legacy or how that's working, but uh, interesting follow. Uh, Bentley Heritage, uh, for those that don't know, uh, Chris Bentley uh, heading up uh, this group down in Minden mm -hmm. in the Carson Valley has been doing some fabulous work. Great work. Bentley Heritage is now open uh, down in Minden. It's a wonderful example of both uh, the estate distillery, which is a relatively new law that we've worked on on behalf of Bentley. 85% of all the raw materials are grown there on land owned by Chris or in the, in, under Nevada law, owned by the person that owns the distillery, the phrase out in Fallon or the other. I would encourage people to go down and see it. The product is great. The tour is wonderful. When you invest over $100 million in a project like that, people are going to notice and it's quite a thing to see. And that's where we got to leave it. Always great. a pleasure to see you, sir. Come back before in the session, okay? It's good to see you. And we'll be right back. Dimitri Prine here for Design Outdoor. Are you a homeowner who's interested in remodeling or building a home? At Design Outdoor, we can show you how adding natural or manufactured masonry stone can add beauty and value to your home. And we refer only the best contractors. Our store and backyard are located at 11600 South Virginia, just north of DeMonte Ranch Parkway. Visit designoutdoor.com or call us at 851-9499. Hey guys, are you watching the game at a friend's or the bargain because you can't watch at home with your wife? Or worse, because she kicked you out and kept your couch, your flat screen, and your kids? What's the one thing a man needs when he loses a good woman? A good lawyer. And when he loses a bad woman, he needs a great lawyer. What makes a good woman a bad woman? You tell me. You're the one that can't watch the game in your own home. I'm men's rights attorney Marilyn York, and I represent men in divorce, custody, and family law matters. Hi, I'm Dave Newman. Remember me? I used to be the house detective, and now I'm a realtor, full-time at REMAX Realty Affiliates. A lot of people ask me, how's the market? You know what? It's fantastic. If you're even kicking around the idea of buying or selling, give me a call. Let's talk about it. Call me at REMAX Realty Affiliates and just ask for the guy who used to be the house detective, Dave Newman. Everyone is talking about opioids, but they're not the only drugs that can be harmful if taken in large quantities or not as prescribed. You also need to be aware of side effects from anxiety drugs, muscle relaxants, sleep aids, and stimulants. Mixing prescription drugs with other drugs or alcohol can be dangerous. If you take an Ambien with a glass of wine, it may be enough to stop you from breathing. Prescribed drugs can be just as dangerous as illegal drugs. Take medications only as directed. This is Nevada Newsmakers. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, coming to you from Carson City. We have a great power pundit panel as always. Attorney Joe Gild is here. Morning. Susan Fisher is Vice President of Government Affairs for McDonald Carano. And uh, Pat Hickey is the Executive Director of the Charter School Association of Nevada. So let's start with you. How in this session that is 
you know, dominated by Democrats or charter schools doing? We're doing surprisingly well. Um, we passed a seven to zero in a Senate committee, a reform bill on uh, online charters and got obviously bipartisan support on that. Uh, another big moment for us was the moratorium bill uh, on the stoppage of any new charters and uh, that was amended out, the moratorium itself was. and that enjoyed... It just made no sense. Well, it really didn't. I mean, I mean, we're overcrowded. We have teachers complaining that, you know, their classrooms are just have way too many kids. Charters are a safety valve besides the other reasons that families are, are increasingly selecting uh, options for their kids. So it, it didn't make any sense, and we were glad that that's gone away. Uh, do you think that the fights between the unions, the teachers' unions, uh, statewide and down in, uh, in the capital, uh, not the capital city, in Las Vegas, uh, <laughs> slip of the tongue yeah, there, yeah. Um, um, are, are going to help charter schools in this go around? Um, I don't know that they're going to help charter schools, Sam. Um, but I don't know that they're going to hurt them either. You know, there, there are bills that, that say that they're there have been some proposals to do bonuses and require a $10,000 bonus for teachers and all, and, and that's all well and good. The, the charter schools are competitive anyway. They've got to pay, um, well, prevailing wage. I use that sort of loosely. They've got to pay that in order to, to compete to get the good teachers as well. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting process, but when you have, even the charter schools have waiting lists. Parents want to have other options for their kids. Regular public school is great for some kids. Charter schools, traditional public charter schools are great for some kids. Private schools are better for others. Online are better for others. I'm just glad that the moratorium went away because the charter authority already has the, the power to be able to limit the growth of them. We don't need a state-imposed moratorium. And do you think we're at the point here in Nevada with charter schools to where it's too late to go back now? We have yeah. to go forward. Yes, I absolutely do, because there's demand for it. Um, Joe, you've now got grandkids in yeah, charter schools. I do. It is. Too and late and your wife is now a retired <laughs> public school public teacher. Public school teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my my grand my grandkids down in Henderson. Um, go to a charter school and they're thriving. My, my grandson, especially my oldest grandson, uh, he's, he just, it, it's a good place for him. And my daughter <clears throat> volunteers at the school every day. So I, the, the stories I hear and the attendance that I, uh, I went to the school last summer uh, with her, um, there's an enthusiasm there. Uh, as there is in lots of other schools. So um, for, for my two grandkids in Henderson and my two grandkids in Reno, uh, it's a good choice for them. And I, I'm glad that choice is there. Um, Susan, uh, <coughs> there was a lot of uh, press releases coming out yesterday afternoon uh, about Senate Bill 358, which would boost Nevada's renewable portfolio standard to 50% mm -hmm. by 2030. Mm -hmm. Is this doable? Yes. Um, is it affordable? Yes because? Well, I, the, the components have decreased in cost. Um, and we have enough track, res, uh, track record, I guess we could say, that with the renewables that, um, you know, with the PPAs, the power purchase agreements, um, those prices are coming down at the utility scale. So I think that we can get there. I think we should get there. And there are a lot of different resources. We do have wind, and there are different parts of Nevada that are that have very good wind in this area. It may seem windy, but it's not consistent wind. But we really <laughs> Well, except right here in Carson City. Yeah, right here in Carson. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's a different kind of wind. Um, Watch your Zephyr. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> but also, we, we really need to be focusing a lot on, on geothermal heat as well, and we need to be looking at storage. So. And, and, and that really is the big issue. And of course, mm -hmm. mining was, uh, you know, the leader yep. in breaking away from the power company. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to see the power companies now concerned about their future resources. Well, mm -hmm. that and uh, don't take my diesel cattle trucks away from me. 
<laughs> okay, <laughs> we will work on that. Um, it's kind of interesting uh, to see NV Energy uh, going after Switch and wanting them to be, um, you know, going to the Public Utilities Commission and being regulated uh, as an energy provider. Um, it seems like that's kind of payback for what happened during the last election. Well, uh, it has been said elections have consequences. Uh, th that's mm -hmm. true. But, uh, you know, obviously Nevadans are in, in favor of options and, and choices. That's true in the energy sector, just as it's true in the education one. All right. I want to change topics on you here because I think that this is crazy for Nevada. Um, but in this particular legislative session, it seems to be going forward, which is uh, this Assembly Bill uh, 186, approved 23 to 17, adding Nevada to this interstate agreement um, <coughs> to take the winner of the presidential election to the national popular vote. This would be terrible for Nevada. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't like that at all. I want, I want to know that my individual vote counts for something, and I don't like that. I think that that takes away from the individual vote. I think that a lot of people will say, what does it really matter? And that we'll have lower turnout. Well, I, I just look at the Electoral College, yeah. and the reason it was designed the way it was was that small states like Nevada would have a voice. Right. right now, we have all these candidates for president uh, already coming to Nevada. You've got a ground game, they'll, Elizabeth they'll Warren. They'll not come back. Uh, mm -hmm. I recently wrote a column in the Progressive Rancher on this issue. Uh, hundreds of times since the Constitution was ratified, the Electoral College has been uh, tried to have been tinkered with. Hundreds of times. This is not new stuff, but it would be devastating for Nevada and other small states like Nevada. Iowa? Who cares about Iowa anymore? Well, uh, and, and the and, Iowa caucuses. And, and I have to tell you, television <clears throat> stations and radio stations, but especially television stations in Nevada, would go bankrupt if something like this passed. Mm -hmm. Well, then I, suppose, I expect your industry will probably oppose that notion. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Yes. Thank you all very much. We'll be right back. A bird's eye captures its surroundings at different heights. At Brian Culp of Photography, we can make your imagination soar over buildings, parks, cityscapes, and beyond. Brian's images tell the story and get the job done. If you need a new perspective to tell your story, contact Brian today. Brian Culpa Photography. Experience the bird's eye view at brianculpaphotography.com. Ah! Hey, Dad? Are you learning? This place is great. Huh? You gotta try this. Wow, this stuff is great. People are gonna love it. Yes. Yes, they will. St. Ives Florist for every holiday and every special occasion. For romance, custom home design, we have the largest selection of fresh flowers in Northern Nevada, and we also offer a large selection of unique gift items. Come see me, Lori Ann, at St. Ives Florist, 700 South Wells Avenue, or call me at 333-9190. Nevada Newsmakers is now available on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll see you next week.